fasting, what a joy it was to begin this day with the Divine Liturgy uh, and such a festival Divine Liturgy. Uh, extremely poignant, so many of the themes um, of our symposium were brought up in the context of last night's hymns, this morning's hymns, which combined, as Father Alexei said in his uh, homily, both the entrance and the last judgment, bringing so much of what we have discussed to bear in our liturgical life. And that ultimately is where everything points for us as Orthodox Christian people. We learn and we study so that we can approach the liturgy more fully and that the liturgy can sanctify our lives more fully. So thanks be to God for that. We are starting today then with a round table. Now, this is a slight innovation. There have been two innovations this year. I'm sorry, it's terribly unorthodox uh, to innovate in this way. We have mechanical pencils and a round table discussion at the same conference. I trust that we will survive this double blow to our stability. Um, the round table discussion is like a panel discussion, which we've had before, uh, except that I have prepared a set of five questions for us to deliberate upon. Um, and all of the panelists will be invited to respond to these. But I also want to stress that you as well are offered to respond uh, yourselves to these questions. I tried to forge these questions out of the conversations that we've had, the questions that have been asked, and some of the themes that have arisen in the talk, uh, for some questions that will provoke us to think about, in particular, the practical ways that we can take this material away. So we'll start by inviting each of the fathers and other panelists to respond. But then if you also would like to ask a question, offer a thought, a commentary, etc., please just raise your hand and we will be more than happy to um, bring you into that discussion. Does that sound sensible and workable? Yes. yes. So I'm going to ask our panelists to come up. Father Philip is also going to be on our uh, round table, but <laughs> Father Philip is um, hosting a parish council meeting today, which was after his liturgy, which was timed to finish in time for him to be here. But parish council meetings being what they are, may the Lord in heaven bless and help him. And uh, we look forward to seeing him when and if he arrives to be with us. He is planning to be here, uh, so hopefully he'll be joining us soon. But Dr. Christopher, uh, Father Alexei, Father James, if you could come up and we will start together. Uh, as I say, I've prepared a few questions uh, in advance uh, for our panelists to look at, and we'll go through them and use them as starting off points. The way things tend to work is that um, by starting with a similar beginning, we tend to wander in our own directions and offer our own reflections, which I think is part of the purpose of this. Uh, but we'll start, and I'm going to start at the end of the row with Father James. You're going to get to be first with our first question, then we'll allow each of the fathers and, and panelists here to answer. The first question, we've called this session, Cherishing the Desert, Reclaiming the City. And the first two questions deal in particular with the desert heritage about which we've talked a great deal and how we cherish it. So the first question, as I've written it, is this, and of course you're welcome to challenge the way I've written it if you'd like to. But here's the question that I've put for us. The theme of obedience has recurred numerous times during the course of this weekend raised in various ways by all of our speakers. What singular piece of guidance or advice would you give us on how we can practically become more obedient in a spiritually healthy way? That's the question that we will begin by asking. There is a phrase in the Holy Gospel from our Savior, and he says, Take care to reconcile with your adversary while you are yet in the way, lest he cast you into prison, and you will not come out until you have paid the last penny. These words of our Lord are, at the outset, somewhat cryptic, but they speak to this question very well. Who is our adversary? The adversary to which the Lord refers is not the adversary that we might think commonly fits the definition of this word, someone who has bad will against us, an actual enemy. Rather, the adversary of our fallen nature, of our sinfulness, is our conscience. 
So the Lord is saying, take care to reconcile with your conscience, to live in accordance with that inner guidance system, that inner prompting, that is what the Holy Fathers say, the voice of God within us. If we don't reconcile with our conscience, we know that we will have no peace until we have taken every necessary step to make good that which we made bad. If we steal $99 and we return, or $100 rather, and we return 99 that $1 in our pocket is going to burn a hole in our pocket and even in our soul until and unless we return it to the owner. He who lives in accordance with his conscience heeds what the Holy Fathers refer to as the voice of God within us. There is no other obedience that we can perform or that we can accomplish that means anything unless we are reconciled with and live in accordance with our conscience. Whoever lives in accordance with his conscience will be one of the most joyful people that walk the planet. You all heard the story about the rock fight that was eventually reconciled yesterday in my youth. It was only after the apology that the conscience was clear and cleaned, and I could feel, so to say, like my true self again. Each one of us can choose to heed the voice of our conscience, and sometimes we might say, but that's really hard. And the answer to that is, but it's much harder not to. Sometimes there's an initial tension when we struggle to avoid a sin. And yeah, sometimes it can be a very serious battle. But you know what's worse? Living with the agony of the consequences of not heeding one's conscience after we do give in to the sin. So the central obedience to which we can strive is to live in accordance with and heed the prompting of our conscience that will lead to a clear obedience in every godly way externally uh, in our life thereafter. I very much like what Father James just said. I, I would only add to it, um, in the Gospels, the Lord Jesus uh, was speaking to his disciples and an oft quoted out of context verse is the word, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And uh, people oftentimes like that idea, the truth shall set you free. But there's something that precedes that. In St. John's Gospel, chapter 8, it says, if you continue in my words, then you are truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And so this idea was continuing on this path. It's not merely that we um, start on this path, that we've gotten baptized, that we've um, been chrismated, that we've begun to attend a few Vesper services and vigil services, and now we're, we're all right. Rather, it's that if you continue in my words, then you are truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So the question is, um, what can we practically do to become spiritually more obedient in a, in a healthy spiritual way? And so it reminds me of St. Simeon, the new theologian. As a young man, what he paid attention to was two things. The Gospels and the scriptures that he was reading and his conscience. And because he kept paying attention to his conscience, he kept growing deeper and deeper and deeper. And so uh, I would only add that the, the foundation for this formation of our conscience is Christ and the Gospels and the, the Church. Um, one thing to keep in mind in reference to the conscience is that there are times when a person can have what St. Paul calls scruples in their conscience. When somebody might be very offended about uh, somebody eating meat, as we heard in the Gospel today, or the Epistle today, 
and someone else has freedom to um, eat meat. And so we find that in the formation of the conscience, there is some latitude. And one of the variables involved with the formation of the conscience is a whole other aspect of obedience, and that is obedience to your spiritual father. Because that formative process of, of Christ working inside of us through the scriptures and through our conscience is helped along through the church, through the reading of the Holy Fathers, and the actual human relationship with the spiritual father. So, those are just a few thoughts. Just following on that, Father, uh, it struck me when you were giving your homily earlier, um, that line of the uh, Gospel, that uh, in the Apostle, would you destroy, would you through your knowledge destroy your brother for whom Christ died? I also particularly in the scholarly world, in the academia, it's referring there particularly to the practice of eating things that tend to a brother, but any use of knowledge has the potential to wound another person. In fact, the more knowledge we have, the more potential we have to wound people. We have to be very careful with that. Thank you. Dr. Benjamin, how would you answer this query about guidance, practical guidance on the more immediate, spiritually healthy way? Well, I'm tempted to say I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> or I wish I, I, I put it into practice better myself. But um, yes, uh, it may come as a surprise to you to hear that I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what has been said before. <laughs> um, and, and the way that it was said as well. So, um, of course, uh, obedience is a spiritual state and it springs from as we learn from Saint Siloan and other great fathers of the church it springs from the desire to discover the will of God for ourselves and the reason why the church encourages us to learn obedience, to live in a state of obedience, is because she wants us to become increasingly aware of the presence of God in every aspect of our lives. God loves us, He's our Father, even the very hairs of our head are numbered, and we grow to appreciate that in the mystery of uh, obedience. So I shouldn't say too much more about this because uh, I'm going to be given a chance to say my piece later. So I'll pass this on to Father now. Well, my dear Dr. Benjamin, I feel as if I should, just as a matter of principle, disagree with everything that you, you must say. <laughs> I find, however, to my great sorrow that I cannot, um, because I actually happen to agree with it all. Let me just offer a, a complementary thought, a practical counsel. We're often seeking after obedience in a manner that's detached from our everyday actions, as if we'll attain this thing called obedience off in the distance that is currently beyond us and separate from our lives. One of the ways to start making obedience immediate is to stop trying to rationally analyze and assent to everything that's given to us. I'm not saying by any stretch that we should shut up our minds and not think, but a lot of the opportunity for obedience, obedience towards a priest, obedience towards a spouse, obedience towards a friend, comes when we introduce our minds and our analysis between what is given to us and what we do. Someone says, do this, and we set about analyzing whether we like what we've been told to do, whether we agree with it, whether we would choose to do that, whether we think it's appropriate, etc., etc. And so we lose an opportunity to be obedient. 
simply by overanalyzing everything. I don't like what my spiritual father says, it's too harsh, he doesn't understand this. I don't like what my spouse says. Now obviously we have to have our minds engaged. We can't mindlessly follow. Obedience is never about mindlessly following. But again, I think we always have to hold in balance the realities that what we stress, to say that obedience must be mindless is true, but it belies the real problem, which is that for most of us, mindlessness is not the issue. It's being far overly analytical. So we mustn't go from one extreme to the other. We have to find that middle ground where we are not constantly trying to assess everything as if it is our ascent that makes something worthwhile. But sometimes simply to hear that which is requested of us and to do it freely, immediately, openly, that starts to build an attitude of obedient love and relationship in our hearts. So that would be a thought on some practical, immediate advice. Father Philip, we're so delighted you're able to join us and to look no worse for the wear. Um, do you have a thought on this first question about practical sense, or would you rather wait for the second question in fairness to your later life? Showing the compassion that is due, we will allow this. I do see a hand in the uh, audience. Could you stand up? We'll deliver you a microphone. Thank you. 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 Thank you
What practical advice would you give to someone seeking to know how to find balance between these two dimensions to the Christian life? And the emphasis of this question is on the relationship of interior prayer to interpersonal ministry. The question of social and political involvement will be focused on in the next question. Question regarding interior stillness and withdrawal and social ministry, where do they meet? I want to um, commend to you one of our Holy Fathers of recent times, St. John of Kronstadt, because uh, he was a saint very involved with helping the poor and constant activity uh, from early morning until night. And it was said that St. John, um, when he was riding on the train and when he was going different places, would be praying the Jesus prayer. And also, of course, you know that one of the things that he practiced was a daily divine liturgy. And um, in the book of Psalms it says, What shall I render unto the Lord for all that he hath given me? I will take the cup of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. As a result, um, these things are not um, contradictory, but they're actually simply the interior and the exterior life of breathing in and breathing out. We breathe in uh, prayer, we breathe out love and service to others. That's manifested in many different ways. Um, St. John, in providing for us this example of Holy Communion and the Jesus Prayer, gives us those things that we need for effective uh, service in this world around us. The difficulty is when we try to do our work alone. When we leave God somewhere else, and we go into this world alone, thinking that somehow we have the answers, or we can do what we need to do. Our Lord teaches us, without me, you can do nothing. So because of this, especially when we're faced with the enormity of problems around us, it humbles us very deeply, and it causes us to realize, I have no wisdom, no capacity to really help this person unless you give me some kind of inkling of inspiration or something to say to this person what I'm going to do. And if we are then in this place of listening, openness and reception, we will receive that little peace that's needed for that person at that moment. This is not unrelated to the first question because if our consciences are clear, will be able to receive help. But if we've cut ourselves off from the Lord, and we're out there sort of in the battlefield, we'll wonder, where did you go? And it's not that the Lord went anywhere. He's still there with us. But because we cut ourselves off from Him with clinging to those things that distance us from the Lord, we'll find that in a time of need, we won't have what we need. And so what we do, we simply turn back to return to the simple path of confession, regular reception of communion, and get back on track with staying in touch, surrounding herself and living in the name of Jesus. As a result, these things begin to come together. Um, every person is different. There aren't cookie-cutter answers for the human race, but there is one wonderful person for the human race, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. St. Paul said, let your speech be seasoned with grace, that you may know how you should respond to each person just as they need. So this is a very interesting idea, because it means that when you're with a person, get out of the way and listen. Be available to the grace of the Holy Spirit, who's with us always, to be able to touch and minister to this person. Most of the time it's very, very simple. Uh, my spiritual father that baptized me, Father Moses Berry, down in Ashgrove, Missouri, he said, listen, you say that you don't know what to do. Is that really the truth? He said, you will receive a reward if you just give a cold drink of water to someone in the name of a disciple. 
surely we can give a cold drink of water to someone. And so, if we then hold on to the Jesus prayer in our heart, and simply open up ourselves to the simple opportunity that we have to help somebody in front of us, it'll work. So, those are a few thoughts. We are unable to help in situations of life and death. In situations where our brethren are suffering or in pain. And we recognize, we recognize that we fall short. And there, of course, is an, is an opportunity, is an occasion uh, to ask God to heal us and to help help the others as well. Which is why we have Forgiveness Sunday. You know? Forgiveness Sunday is not just to ask others to forgive us for the sins that we've committed against them. It's to ask them to forgive us for not being what we should be. Because if we were uh, truly what we should be, then this world would be uh, a slightly better place. And um, so I go back to that word of uh, <coughs> Father Zacharias that we can't inspire others unless we ourselves are inspired. We cannot comfort others unless we ourselves are comforted by none other than the comforter. I only want to contribute by offering a very brief story um, about St. John of San Francisco. One of the great privileges I have to serve in St. Tichon's parish, the house where St. John lived, is to spend considerable time with many of his children, the orphans who uh, grew up under his wing at that house, which was then, uh, we call it the orphanage, it was never really an orphanage, it was the extension of the orphanage that he ran in Shanghai. Um, but to, to meet these people, not just for a few minutes, but to get to know the children that he raised over the course of years, and to hear the stories that are not told um, out of a desire to contribute to the hagiography, as it were, but are literally just stories of a person that they remember and that they knew very, very well, and grew up with, and was their parent. And the story that came into my mind as I heard some of these responses was about the way St. John, in the latter years of his life, would receive people at St. Tiffon's. He had his keli, his cell, which is still preserved there. Uh, it's a site of great pilgrimage in this city. People come to see it, pray, and we hear confessions in the, in the cell, um, as he did when he would confess people. Um, but towards the end of his life, he had been known as a miracle worker and a wonder worker for many, many years while he was alive. Even when he was the Archbishop in uh, Western Europe, people knew him to have the ability to see into the heart. Um, people would travel even from England. Bishop Callistos, when he was here a few years ago, you might recall, told the story of having a certain need and being instructed in England to go down to France and see that bishop who knows how to look into the heart. And he was helped. By the end of his life, that reputation, of course, had become extensive, and people came and would line up literally um, filling the house, waiting to get in to have a word with Lodika John in his cell, to receive counsel, to receive confession, and this healing that came from his purity. And he would serve the liturgy in the morning, he would visit people in the hospitals, and according to one of his children who told me this, would then spend literally the whole rest of the day uh, in his cell as the people would line up in the hallway, sit on the steps, gather around on the sofas, waiting their turn. And he would receive them late into the night, until she told me, at some point, usually very late in the evening, the house would still be full of people waiting for their turn. This was a daily occurrence. She, not he, would close the door and announce to them, that's it folks, Vladika is tired and he hasn't eaten anything. And she would close the door. They wouldn't leave, mind you. They would sit and wait. And she would take Vladika John into the little kitchen, onto the little yellow table that's still there, where she would have prepared him a little food. And he would eat it, 
And they would sit together, just the two of them, quietly. And the thing that I most noted about her story, about her recollection, was that when he was done eating, St. John always insisted on sitting with her while she did the dishes. He wouldn't leave her alone. He wanted to sit with her. She said he would often, almost always just be silent. Sometimes he would sleep a little bit there, but he never left her. But this was a little time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, when he would be able to sit silently and pray, simultaneously caring for someone by being with them. But he would have this moment to be quiet. Then he would go back into his cell, and the door would open, and the people would start to come again into the late hours of the night, until finally he would take a little bit of sleep, and in the morning would start again with the liturgy. St. John gave himself in a way that is astonishing to everyone who came to him. But he needed a little time, like everyone needs a little time, to receive that comfort that you were talking about, uh, Dr. Christopher. Uh, everyone, even the greatest of saints, has to have those moments of quiet when their heart is filled up again so that they can give of what they have received to others. So just a little recollection rather than any concrete counsel. Father Phil. Yeah, just to, have I gone too long, but just to say that sometimes it seems that, well, my son actually, Michael, said to me a week ago, so he said, Dad, isn't it really selfish the way we talk about this spiritual life the whole time? I mean, it's all about me. It's all about my spiritual progress and my salvation. And it doesn't sound very Christian, you know, so... And it occurred to me that often that is the case, even when we're praying the Jesus Prayer, we're thinking, what am I going to get out? Am I really becoming a hesychist? You know, what is God going to give me? Come on, you know, I'm saying the prayer, you know, but can't we just pray? And because God loves us, because Christ wants to come into our heart, and because He gave us life with a spirit of thankfulness. And then when that thankfulness fills us and overflows, then it's a natural thing to want to go and help others. It's the same thing, the same principle that's already been spoken of, but just that interesting thought that sometimes we have to catch ourselves at the point where we, you know, what, what is our intention? Are we, it's always me, 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 and wanting, demanding from God this and that and the other. And then naturally, uh, the response is to want to help our brother, but not you know, not because God is going to bless me if I go out and do this, but just because He's commanded us to do that. Father James, I wonder if I could ask you to be the first responder to our next question, which carries on with this theme about balancing our inner and outer life, but in a slightly different way. And here we look towards our theme of reclaiming the city, as it were. The march that took place here a few weeks ago uh, the pro-life march, the Walk for Life, I think it's called, the West Coast Walk for Life, which was a very big event. And I know there were some Orthodox churches that had very large cohorts there, uh, and there were some that didn't. And that was sort of the prompt that I had in mind. But the deeper question, how much should we be involved in these political activities? Or is our influence born in another way, or is it a mixture of these? How would you respond to that, Jim? To take um, Father... In particular, uh, the example that you gave, there certainly is room for participation by Orthodox Christians in such marches as, um, as you mentioned, the uh, uh, recent marches in favor of uh, pro-life. But I think that we maximize the impact and the influence of our participation in these things by knowing the why of our participation. It isn't just to make an expression with regard to something that might be considered wrong or contrary to the tenets of our faith, but we have to be able not only to answer a given question, a social question, but we have to make sure that we've understood the question and its assumptions before we begin to answer it. And sometimes we too hastily attempt to answer questions before we have fully digested them. So for example, if we, if we understand 
the underpinnings of the social question on the matter that you raised, we would have to be able to explain to our uh, opponents why their position is, is wrong, and in a way that they would be able to understand and feel invited into the principles of our faith. The underpinnings of this whole so-called freedom in the uh, pro-choice so-called movement is that there really is no consequence to um, this understanding of intimacy as a kind of pursuit of personal pleasure. God has created intimacy for the furtherance of the uh, Christian and of the, of, the, of the human race, rather. This gift of procreation in which we participate with God, we collaborate with God in the creation of life, has been brutalized by what can only be described in our time as the reduction of procreation to recreation. And once this takes place in any kind of environment, then there is no responsibility attached to it. And that which gives rise to the creation of life suddenly is turned into the occasion for implementation of death. So to the extent that we participate in a movement that can be considered a social movement, we have to make sure that we are very well prepared to explain to our opponents why their position is wrong and why the Christian position is much more attractive and to get to the assumptions that underlie their position. Otherwise, you're just basically throwing insults, yelling at each other, and these kinds of things are not witnesses to the essential principles that hopefully we're bringing into that environment. So we need to make sure that we're well-educated and that we have the form of presentation that uh, has the maximum impact. Thank you, Father. Dr. Benjamin, I wonder, would you be interested in responding to this question as well of whether or not? You were afraid I would, I would ask you. But it, it, it's a question I think that it weighs on a lot of people's minds because we're constantly prompted for action. Should we be involved in these political movements, social activities, or, or is that inappropriate, or something in between? Thank you, Father May. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think we all know that really it's the spiritual state of a culture that is behind all of the uh, manifestations of the way that the culture lives. Um, so, ultimately, uh, whether you take part in these uh, events or not, uh, what really has to happen is, you know, the heart, the heart of man has to be transformed. And of course, uh, Father James is right that uh, we should understand why uh, we believe what we believe um, and be able to express it uh, as best we can. Uh, but really the, the, the transformation takes place when God informs the heart of man. And that's what the church is constantly praying for. That is the life of the church. Um, it's clear, for example, that on the uh, on, on this burning question of uh, what should I call it abortion, the, the abortion question, the position of the church is clear. I, I don't see how anyone could um, think otherwise. 
problem is, is that people are not members of the church and they, they don't understand the ethos of the church. So we have a lot of work to do and Thomas Fronny used to say, I have only one desire and that is to change the world by one. Father Alexei, I wonder if I can put you on the spot by twisting the question a little bit and asking for um, for you, Father Alexei, just carrying on with the theme. But one question that's been expressed to me many times connected to this that I wonder if you'd be willing to address is the issue of the baggage that comes along with a lot of the sort of groups and activities that are out there. I wonder if your experiences working in urban ministry may have exposed you to this. For example, let me just give you a few examples. If you want to support um, the, the right to life, the so-called non-abortion side of things, it lumps you in automatically with the conservative movement, which has a lot of things you don't like. If you want to oppose the death penalty, this lumps you in with the liberal movement, which espouses a lot of things you don't like. I sometimes go, and uh, at times there's a group uh, from the neighborhood where I live that goes and offers food to uh, homeless people in Golden Gate Park. And just to do that act, lumps you in with, a, with a, the hippie movement, the sort of hate Ashbury hippie movement. And so there I am, and people are saying, Father, you know, do you want me to get you a sun crystal for next weekend? Can I have extra? <laughs> um, so a lot of people are worried about getting involved in some movement or activity that supports a cause that they feel strongly about because of the baggage that goes along with the broader movement. How do we react to that? What, what do we do in the face of that? Remember, first and foremost, that we're Christians. And the definition of our Lord Jesus Christ in St. John 3 is you can't tell where the wind is coming from or where it's going so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And so because of this, we have to understand that at times, people will try to peg us, to control us. But when they see our decisions based upon, this key word, conscience, they will recognize that we are cut from different cloth. We're following, as Thoreau said, a different drum. I think it's, it's important to remember the two central figures in the life of, in, the, in the Gospels, St. John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus Christ. It said of St. John the Baptist that he came neither eating nor drinking, and they, called him, they said that he had a demon. And the Son of Man has come both eating and drinking, and they called him a gluttonous man and a wine bibber. And he says, but wisdom is justified by her children. And I think ultimately that's what's involved with this issue, is that we have to uh, realize that our Lord and His providence will put the body of Christ in many situations because He wants to save all people and some will respond. And so because of this, the, the, the net of the kingdom of God is cast. And that net is cast through you and me. And when we're involved with this world, our consciences, responding to the Holy Spirit, will put us in many different places. This is why I don't think that we have an absolute answer of how the church is going to respond in terms of political movements and all of these situations. But rather we have the individual members of the body of Christ that will, some will get involved with political issues. Some will get involved with social ministry. Some will get involved in different kinds of activities. But the advice that Elder Paisios, of, um, the new Saint, Saint Paisios of Mount Athos said, he said that monks are really like radio operators in the military. And the people that are involved with um, the activity in the city are more like infantry on the front line. He said there are times when the radio operators need to take up their rifle and, and get involved with the, the midst of the fray. But he said, don't you think it would be much more helpful 
if that radio operator could stick to his job and begin to call in the Air Force and the Navy, because if he was able to contact headquarters, then you wouldn't just have one gun fighting, you'd have the whole Air Force and the Navy and all of the other uh, help coming to solve that particular problem. Like we read and heard yesterday, St. Ephraim of Syria had to leave being a radio operator for a little while and come to do the work on the front lines with helping the people during the famine. And yet, there absolutely needs to be the monastics in that role of deep prayer so that they can be able to cover the rest of the members of the, the body of Christ out there in the front lines doing this kind of work. We need each other. We need desperately to be able to have everyone involved with serving Christ in these different spheres so that we can be able to go forth. Nevertheless, we're constrained and we're compelled by the gospel, by the teachings of the church. And as we allow ourselves to be more purified and more formed and our consciences are more clear, what will happen is that our very presence will begin to bring conviction to the world around us. One of my great stories that I remember about St. John Maximovich was one feast of St. John of Kronstadt. And at that particular time, as the story goes, um, he was having an all-night vigil, perhaps in this very church. I don't know. Yes, it was the first vigil. It was the first vigil. But hardly anybody was there because they had all gone to a masquerade party and they on Halloween. And so, after the vigil, St. John ended up going to the masquerade ball. But he wasn't dressed up like a, um, some Halloween costume. He was dressed as he was, Archbishop John. And with the staff, he knew who each one was behind their different masks. And so the members of the congregation, he walks up to them and looks them straight in the face. And he goes on to the next one, looks that one straight in the face. Looks up, goes to the next one, looks that one straight in the face, and didn't say anything. His very presence and that look was enough to let people know, oh man, I've been busted. I don't <laughs> think they would say that exactly, but you get the idea. And as a result, the next day, many, many people were in church. The kind of influence that could come from that kind of encounter was someone that was living in touch with Christ and their conscience and the influence of godliness was working. Regarding the early Christians, it was said that what the conscience is to the body, the Christians are in the world. Is that true today? Unfortunately, because the disciples have not been disciples, the salt has lost its saltiness. And so because of that, to regain it is exactly what's needed. We're on the very edge of being, as Jesus said, good for nothing but to be trampled under foot of men. How is this regained? It's regained by deep repentance. It's regained by coming back to ourselves and beginning again. I was, uh, for 30 years, as you know, as we, we were talking about, deeply involved with social work and social ministry. But I also recognized deeply that that did not take the place of monastics doing their work of praying. And it also is the same thing that we said earlier about this interior prayer as we go forward. So, where do we find ourselves? Where, do we, where we are in this world? Let us listen then to that guidance of the Holy Spirit and our spiritual fathers with helping us find our niche, our place in this world. So that whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in the education system, whether it's in the church, whether it's in the neighborhoods, that we can do our parts to be able to influence the world for Christ. I just want to say one final thing. We aren't here to bring about the thousand year reign of Christ. We aren't here in a position where we're anticipating permanent social change by our activity. We are here as martyr witnesses. This idea, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, that word is martyri, martyr witnesses. It means that we're there to simply shine the light of Christ in the culture around us. 
And so because of that, at times we will be given great favor and we can make great strides. But we should not somehow make the assumption that that's going to be a permanent change. These are simply opportunities for more people to be saved. The passions are always present with us and the world around us. And so because of that, each successive generation needs to be once again brought up to the same level of repentance and baptism as the preceding one. So, thank you, Father. The next question concerns the panel discussion yesterday in which the theme of judgment and hell was raised, fittingly in light of the liturgical theme of this very weekend. And we were able to see a very nice example of how seemingly divergent views disclose underlying convergence through close conversation. Let us therefore go a little further with a connected theme. What is the right place of chastisement in love as it is expressed in this life? We sometimes hear love expressed as a universal acceptance of anything and everything, which we know from the gospel is not correct. But we also sometimes encounter it expressed as little more than a continual condemnation of those committing sin on grounds that, quote, it is loving to chastise the sinner for his correction, unquote. Is there truth in this? How do we strike a healthy balance? So to whom shall this question be referred well, first? I'll start, and we'll see where it goes from there. I have to say that I am very tired of hearing sermons about how evil homosexuality is, about how evil abortion is, about how evil certain moral and immoral choices might be. And this is not because we don't need to know these things. I think Dr. Christopher said with respect to one of these issues, the church's teaching on them is clear. That doesn't mean we need to never mention it. We do need to proclaim the church's teaching because, as you said, the problem is that a lot of people aren't Christian, aren't churched. But my question always when I hear the 38th homily in a row that says homosexuality is bad, for example, abortion is wrong, my subsequent question is, okay, we know that, now what? How does this help me? What I need is not simply to be told that something is bad, but I need to be told what to do to change the way I live, the way I interact with people. And I think that that is a kind of, that frustration I feel on that theme relates to the place that I think chastisement has in love. We need to be chastised. The Lord chastiseth the one whom he loves. Chastisement is not always pleasant. It's not pleasant to be called out on our sin. It's not pleasant to be, in a sense, chastisement involves a kind of punishment, but not in retribution, a kind of fire that burns away that which is wrong in us and leaves us pure. But chastisement has to lead towards that purification, and I think often we fail in the way we love other people by only taking the first part of the fire, the burning of the sinner, without the illuminating, purifying part that fire is supposed to play. Iron is strengthened, purified by the refining fire, it says in the scriptures. When we love another person, if we love them genuinely, yes, that absolutely has to involve identifying sin, letting them know. If someone is about to walk off a cliff and you don't tell them the cliff is there, you're doing them no favors. If someone is taking poison into their heart by the way they live, and you love them, and you have a relationship with them, person to person, and you don't help them see that, then you are not loving them. But at the same time, 
It's not enough just to say, that's a sin, you're sinning. The question is, how can I offer my life towards that person, for that person, in a way that helps them, and me, ultimately, through that temptation? So I think when we love, there must be a chastising element, but that chastisement always has to come in the form of entering into the suffering that we are chastising. If I see a person suffering, and I identify that sin, unless I'm willing to enter into that suffering with that person, and say, I will join you there in your grief, let us together find a way out. Not joining them in their sin, of course not. Then you simply both thrown into the pit. But I will join you in the agony that you're feeling. I will take into my own heart some of the suffering which ultimately causes us to trip again and again into sin. I will share that with you so that together we can find a way to be strengthened in the spiritual life. The fact that I've been able to see a sin that you might not have seen doesn't mean I don't need strengthening in the spiritual life. You will see sin to me that I don't see. That's the fruit of two persons entering into relation with one another. But to chastise without co-suffering is simply to prod a person. We may be right and we justify ourselves by saying that we're right. We are, it really is sinful. They shouldn't do that. But it does nothing for their salvation unless we offer ourselves to suffer with them, to help them be strengthened in Christ. Right, here we go. <laughs> um, St. Porphyrios of um, Kafsimamudia, the recently acclaimed saint, Porphyrios, whom I was blessed to have known personally. Um, he says that when you want to say something to your children, to teach them something, uh, to instruct them, to correct them, it's actually better and more effective if you say what you want to say to them to God. Because God alone knows the depths of our heart, what's taking place in the heart of each person. And though you may see something that you can, you feel that you recognize as a, uh, something wrong with the, with the other, we're not always correct because that requires tremendous discernment. And that discernment can come only from God. We see that the saints of the church, holy men and women, do have that discernment. There's a risk, there's a risk therefore in saying something to my brother when I see this or that taking place. Perhaps there are situations where one could feel more confident about what is taking place. And a, a brotherly, uh, loving word can help. But here's the thing. When one is truly in a state of repentance oneself, don't really see what the other is doing. Because you're not focused on the other person. You're focused on asking God to heal you and to help you to change. So this is a tremendously important question. It requires much greater treatment than we are able to give it here in this context. But I think these are just a few things that we should bear in mind as we uh, as we consider being proactive. I mean, you know, 
We want to have good intentions. We must be, we must be cautious, however, because God is the only true physician. And uh, I might actually say something and do something that could make the situation worse. But if I ask God to intercede, to, to intervene, or if I ask a saint to inter intercede, that could be that could be a very beneficial thing indeed. We have a question. Yes. More of, more of a thought. Um, this is a question that I've reflected on a great deal as I look ahead to priestly ordination, God willing. And I find that uh, one of the difficulties that I run against is in our present culture, we've upheld tolerance as sort of a new virtue. And uh, if you look at the word tolerance, if you'll pardon me, it comes from a Latin word, uh, to bear, to carry. And so this idea that we, we carry whatever the, the sin of the other person is, we just put up with it. But I think the parable of the Good Samaritan can really help us to reflect on how we ought to love the sinner. Uh, because if you look at the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, we find this person wounded lying on the side of the road in great need. If we imagine a sinner in a similar state, their soul lying in the ditch, so to speak. Our culture would say the virtue would be to pass that person by and to leave them as they are, uh, not to judge them. But it's the Samaritan that truly tolerates that person by picking them up and carrying them to the inn, which we can see as the church, and Christ is the innkeeper. And the coins that the Samaritan leaves with the innkeeper as our prayers for that person, once we've left them in the ministry, uh, of God's care, and uh, just to avoid falling into that person's uh, troubles and getting pulled down. Whenever I'm ministering to someone, uh, and that ministry is requiring more than I can possibly give, I always pray, um, Lord Jesus, save this person, because I can't. You know, you are the Savior. Thank you very much for adding that thought. Yes, um, I think I think you've concluded by saying basically what I was what I was trying to say. However, you introduced a very important theme, which in the Orthodox spiritual tradition does not have a significant place, and that is you you brought the imagination into your interpretation of a scriptural passage. There is no indication in that scriptural passage that the person, the Samaritan, uh, the, not the Samaritan, the person who was, who was beaten up by the robbers was a sinner. He was beaten up. In fact, there's no leeway given in that passage for you to go on that kind of excursus and say, well, this was probably the case. There's no leeway. It's just a simple fact. This, fact, this person was beaten up and left for dead by robbers. So it's not actually an example to, to take and say, if you see the sinner, therefore, you know, the parable of the Good Samaritan gives us the answer as to what to do. Once upon a time, I had, um, went for a walk with Elder Sifrani, and he asked me, to my surprise, do you experience dreams? Do you have dreams, Christopher? And I said to him, strange as it may seem, for a long time, at that time, I hadn't had any dreams. And he said to me, good, 
because nothing that you could possibly imagine could ever come close to the reality of God. And as it happens, Father Sophroni has an entire chapter in his book, St. Cyril and the Athenite, has an entire chapter devoted to the struggle against the imagination and its various forms. I just take the opportunity given by the, uh, the, the seminary uh, to pick up on that subject and say that our culture probably overindulges the imagination and it doesn't help in spiritual terms because the reality uh, of God surpasses anything that we could possibly conceive of. And um, the Holy Scriptures bear witness to this because the various narratives, as I said before, leave very little room for imagination. <coughs> Thank you to you both for some fruitful thoughts there. I wonder if very succinctly, briefly, because we must move along, I could ask uh, other three panelists to respond also on this issue of chastisement and <coughs> love. Maybe Father James, if you could begin. In connection with yesterday's discussion, the first question that we addressed on obedience, and particularly obedience to the conscience, and this theme of Chast, you know, chastisement and love. How do we correct somebody? I want to read something from St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco and reflect then on this question of chastisement. He writes, The end of the world signifies not the annihilation of the world, but its transformation. Everything will be transformed suddenly in the twinkling of an eye. And the Lord will appear in glory on the clouds, trumpets will sound, and loudly with power. They will sound in the soul and conscience. All will become clear to the human conscience. The prophet Daniel, speaking of the last judgment, relates how the ancient of days, the judge, sits on his throne, and before him is a fiery stream. Fire is a purifying element, it burns sins. Woe to a man if sin has become part of his nature. Then the fire will burn the man himself. Yea, this fire will be kindled within a man. Seeing the cross, some will rejoice, but others will fall into confusion, terror, and despair. Thus men will be divided instantly. The very state of a man's soul casts him to one side or the other, to the left or to the right. The more consciously and persistently a man strives toward God in his life, the greater will be his joy when he hears, Come unto me, ye blessed. Conversely, the same words will call the fire of horror and torture on those who did not desire him who fled and fought or blasphemed him during their life. The Last Judgment knows of no witnesses or written protocols. Everything is inscribed in the souls of men, and these records, these, quote, books, unquote, are opened at the judgment. Everything becomes clear to all and to oneself, and some will go to joy while others to horror. When, quote, the books are opened, unquote, it will become clear that the roots of all vices lie in the human soul. Here is a drunkard or a lecher. When the body has died, some may think that sin has died too. No. There was an inclination to sin in the soul, and that sin was sweet to the soul. And if the soul has not repented of the sin, and has not freed itself from it, it will come to the last judgment also with the same desire for sin, 
and it will never satisfy that desire. And in that soul, there will therefore be the suffering of hatred. It will accuse everyone and everything in its tortured condition, and it will hate everyone and everything. This is the gnashing of teeth, that is, of powerless malice, and the unquenchable fire of hatred, a fiery Gehenna, such is the inner fire. Here there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, such is the state of hell. One of the most important things that Orthodox Christians can offer in chastisement and love is to offer to the one to, to whom they are speaking the understanding that our God is not a vindictive deity that consigns people to hell because he, like a human judge, considers them guilty of specific sins. He has come to take all the sins upon himself and free us. We are not striving to be freed from a wrathful and vindictive God. We are striving to be freed from a wrathful and vindictive inner desire for sin. And so when we chastise people, it's so helpful to endeavor to open unto them the understanding that, if I may quote the preacher Jonathan Edwards, we are not, quote, sinners in the hands of an angry God. One of the reasons that people have such a hard time coming to God is because this very juridical image of God has now been taught principally in the West uh, since the time of Anselm of Canterbury. And it's very hard to love such a God or to consider him truly merciful. So <clears throat> when someone is calling to attention and speaking about a certain sinful propensity within another person, it's very important to open up to that person the understanding that they don't, they should not strive to set themselves up to become codependent forever on something that not only in this life brings no ultimate satisfaction, but which cannot bring satisfaction and joy in the next life. Thank you so much, Father, for that. Father Philip, and I'd like to have the Prime Minister to be rather concise for time. But... Okay. Um, Father Sophroni wrote a number of times in his book, We Shall See Him As He Is, that a person, it's hard to call a person who doesn't pray for the whole world a Christian. And those are very hard words. But in part in response to Father James, is that our hope and our prayer is for the whole world to be saved. And we can't pretend suddenly that we can pray for the whole world like Father Sophroni, but we need to have that orientation. Once I was, not long after I'd first been to the monastery, I was taking a trip into London, um, and I took the trip, and uh, I was very disturbed by all these people in the, in the tube, in the, tr in the train, disturbing my prayer. And I said to Father Raphael, I said, Father Raphael, in fact, I was giving Father Raphael a ride to the tube station, I said, Father Raphael, how do you do it? All these people around you, all their passions, all their, you know, he said, I pray for them. He said, do the same, pray for them, you know. He said to me, whenever you find yourself taking a passion, taking control of you, a struggle, you're in a struggle, he said, at that moment, pray for all the people in the whole world who are struggling with that very, at the very same moment as you with that very same passion. And in that way, our orientation is not all on ourself again, but it's outward. And we lose that, that self-egotism all the time. And then our prayer is for everybody. Father Sophroni uh, wrote about Gethsemane and the prayer of Christ in Gethsemane for the whole world. He shed blood. He faced the abyss of despair, the despair which is in the world. And he faced that and conquered it in prayer, defeated it. So he's defeated that prayer. So if we can enter in some minuscule way into that prayer of Christ in Gethsemane, 
then we're on the right track to not despair, but to have hope for the salvation of the whole of mankind. I very much appreciated what everybody said, and I don't have anything else to add to it. I'm thankful for the quotations and for uh, the reflections. Um, I'm also reminded, uh, Dr. Christopher, from your remarks of the different contexts in which we're called to speak. I was thinking, your point that we, when we're repentant, we don't see the sins of others. We have Lenten discussions at St. Ticons, and several people are here who come to those. People who are there are very aware of my constant repetition that to judge anyone at all is usually spiritual temptation, even if the judgment is correct. I think one of the things that we have to take away is there are different situations. I find myself thinking more and more as a priest. As a priest, we have a duty to speak into the world in a way. But each of us is at the end of the day a bare Christian being. At the end of the day, when we go to our homes or to our cells and we take off the cross that might hang around the neck, the mitre that might sit on a head, the omophore, the panegia, we are all creatures struggling for repentance. And when the charge that God may have given us to fulfill in certain context has been exercised, we have to again face our heart, the sin that's there, and seek its change and the change of all those around us for good. I just want to wrap up this session by quoting the entirety, and you'll be remarkably impressed at my fine memory skills here. I'm going to quote the entirety of a sermon from memory. I read this sermon this morning before the liturgy. It popped up on my phone. I normally don't pay attention to my phone before the liturgy, but the from field that popped up on the screen began Bishop. And when it starts with Bishop, I usually listen. So I clicked it open and it was a link forwarded to me by a bishop, a homily for the last judgment given in Russia. And I will now quote from beginning to end by memory the entirety of the homily. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, O Lord, I thank Thee that I shall be judged by Thee and not by other men. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful sermon? <laughs> May God give us the grace to trust in the loving judgment of a man befriending and merciful God. Thank you to all our panelists for the wonderful thoughts to fuel us along.